In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, me and my co-host Richard Stamen, we are going to discuss sleepers that are ranked on the consensus board after number 20 that we think have a chance to be stars. Stay tuned to find out who we are discussing. Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. And this episode is brought to you by the Game Time app. Create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies and the new director of scouting for the NTX Combine. And my co-host is the man that you guys all know him. He is one of Draft Twitter's favorites. It is Richard Stamen, Mr. Mavs Draft. What's going on in your area? Man, uh, Combine's now, what, two and a half, three weeks away. It's uh, it's heating up. Things, I think now is when teams, I, I'm both pretty sure ne- within this next week, teams are holding their first draft workouts. Uh, so a lot is uh, starting to turn. We'll start seeing more and more storylines come out. Yep, I did hear a few teams that are starting workouts. I've even heard some teams that normally don't even hold early workouts are looking to hold some early workouts. I won't mention the name of the teams because I don't want nobody to get in trouble because they told me. But, yeah, it's it's starting to come. The combine is a few weeks away. Um, I'm still waiting on approval. I got approved last year, so hopefully it's back-to-back years. The combine is a great experience, but at the same time, None of the top 30 guys show up. I spoke to an agent today that has multiple players that are projected to go into the in, in the top 30. And he's like, why? Why send them? And then he you know, this is something we can talk about. He was adamant that. The, you know, the new rules that they made that players have to participate in the combine. He was totally, totally against it. And um, he was saying that there's a meeting supposed to be coming up. And I guess they're still going to fight this or try to fight this or whatever, because agents just do not do not like it. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, nobody wants to see their guy get exposed. And when you're a top five prospect, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain. Right. At best, you might be able to jump up one slot, which depending on the slot, it could be big if you can go from two to one. But there's really no benefit for these premier prospects. It's the combine is and always has been an event that is big for the risers and the guys trying to climb up into the relevant lottery range or really even into draftable range. So it's a little bit different when you start talking about, Hey, what if Zion went to the combine and had to play in the combine, it would have been a whole different discussion, right? I mean, there could have been, Oh, he can't shoot. We might have to worry about that and things like that. Or, I mean, just like think of Zion went and his, I don't know, body fat test came out or whatever. Yep. And now that's a story. Oh, Zion has has this. Or I'm just trying to think of guys that could be really negatively impacted at the combine this year without playing like measurements. Or if somebody measures shorter or someone's wingspan is shorter. I mean, we, we saw just like the backlash Imani Bates got just from Memphis's yeah. pro day his freshman year about he had like a negative wingspan or six nine wingspan so I, I could see how that how that could happen if you got a guy that's projected to go but I'm just worried that this year by it being I guess maybe the last year like is anybody going to do anything at the combine which kind of leads into the subject guys that are consensus or consensus has them going after 20. Those guys might be the only ones playing at the combine, even though last year, if I remember correctly, 30 is like 32 or 33 of my top 60 guys did not participate in the combine. I think the only two that did were Jalen Williams and Terquavion Smith. Those were the only two that I can remember. Maybe David Roddy, and he had an awful combine and it did not impact his you know, where he wanted to draft. He actually went higher than I thought he would go after having a terrible combine. All right, so based off the consensus, 
at number starting at number 20, who is the player that you think has the best chance to be a, a breakout star? Yeah, I think it's cheating to say number 20, but I'm going to do it anyways. I think Dariq Whitehead is massively underrated on these boards. I think he's a minimum top 15 prospect. The shooting touch is very real while having a very reasonable path to improving his shot. Like I think it's still a little bit far away in terms of from his ceiling. Obviously he had ridiculous indicators over 40% from three. And I think it was almost 90% from the line or over 80% at least. But I think he's somebody who, if he were to play in the combine, he'd be the best player easily there. And I don't think he will play. But I think he's got to be where the conversation starts. Obviously, it's cheating at number 20, but it is still a very valid, like, he's a guy who, he was the top three recruit in high school. He went to Duke, had some injuries, didn't perform as much as people would have liked for him to. But I just, I think the context really paints a clear picture. He's hidden upside. He is with Excel. He is not going to be participating at the combine if I were a betting man. Excel last year had a huge, like a ridiculously large pro day. It was like three hours long, if I remember correctly, because they had such a huge class combining international players. And then some guys that tested the waters um, or tested the water. Is it singular or plural? I don't know. But yeah, I can't see him participating at the combine. I think he is a lock to go in the first round anyway. And I could just see guys that are locks to go in the top 30, maybe even 40, not not participating. Who is next on, on your list? I know who mine is, and I've been talking about him all year. Mine is Gigi Jackson. Yeah, I mean, Gigi is definitely the guy. I'll, to change it up, I'll go with actually number 22, and th- that's 20, 21 and 22. So I think it says a lot. I would say 22 is Leonard Miller, and that's my pick. I think he's somebody who, speaking of the combine, last year had a terrible combine. Definitely was not a uh, 2022 prospect. Yeah, I think he did a really good job in the G League this year. Great finisher at the rim. Uh, I think he's got great defensive upside. Really all that missing is a reliable three-point shot, but he could grow into that. He's somebody who actually I do think he might. I think that's not going to come down to, one, who his agency is, and two, if he really wants to come out. He's He's got a powerful agency behind him. Yeah, okay, so he's not playing. BDA, WME. Um, and they, I mean, they've got a great class. I don't know if you keep up with like, like I do, but yep. they have Cam Whitmore, Jairus Walker, Grady Dick, Jalen Wilson. Um, I'm missing somebody. Uh, but yeah, they have a great, a great class. Uh, Anthony Black is in that class. So they have some power going into, going into this combine. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't expect to see him playing either. Hey, don't forget uh, Isaiah Wong in there too. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He... <laughs> so, you gotta, you gotta shout out my guy. You know, I can't go one episode without saying it, without saying his name. <laughs> you should just say where Isaiah Wong. Sure. You know what? Maybe the next episode, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have a timer, and then when you say Isaiah Wong, it's gonna go off. Or Mike Miles. <laughs> Mike Miles. Yeah, yeah. I got, I got I got to look and see where he's at on on this list for for the he's consensus. at fifty eight. If that's if somebody you want we... to climb down that far, like we'll get we'll get there eventually. Like I think he's far and away the best prospect ranked forty and after yeah. on here. I I think it's not close. You could maybe say Keontae Johnson. He's probably the only one for me that's close. I I don't see guys like Jalen Clark. I think it's awesome that he is going to test the waters. I don't think he stays in the draft. For example, that Achilles injury just seems br- just absolutely brutal, and I don't think he'll be 100% for these workouts. Yeah, I had a discussion about Leonard Miller today, and it was with a, another agent, and it wasn't an agent just kind of hating because it wasn't his client, but he brought up some interesting points about Leonard Miller just being divisive. I think people either are all in on him or there's some people that are totally – trying to figure out what exactly is his role and what he does best. And I had mentioned, I said, look, I was at the game where he had like 20 rebounds and I think he's a better passer than what he was able to show. I think he's a weapon, but there are some people that just do not believe in Leonard Miller at all, despite the fact that he had really good numbers. I mean, the numbers that he put up in March in the G league were 
crazy. I think I mentioned the the numbers last last episode or last week or something like that. I haven't written down, but he had some crazy numbers. Uh, let me see if I got. Oh yeah, in March, Leonard Miller, twenty two points, thirteen rebounds, two assists, one steal, one point seven blocks, sixty four percent from the floor, fifty eight percent from three, ninety percent from the free throw line. You can't deny those numbers, and I, it's weird to me because I think if some other prospects finish as strongly as he did and had those numbers, you'd be talking, they'd be like, oh, yeah, he's a lottery pick because how strong he finished. In your opinion, why are people so divided about Leonard Miller? It's two things. The jump shot. I mean, I wouldn't say he has much terribly different form at this point than like Trace Jackson Davis, and that's not a good thing. Uh, and not just because they're lefties. They both start really high and like the release point's kind of awkward, but I don't think it's broken by any means. It is very far away. I think there's a difference. I think there's some hope. The touch clearly is there. Um, and then also just, I would say one, for whatever reasons, you ignite still is divisive. I personally don't understand anymore when the early returns show these guys at least are going to stick. It's obviously too early to tell at what level, but I think almost every one of the guys outside of, I think Isaiah Todd that's been drafted has found a niche role. I mean, even Dacian Nix, or he was undrafted actually, so he doesn't even yep. qualify for this, but you know, Houston fans don't like him, but <laughs> I think it's that. And then also just the combine last year, he was a divisive guy last year. He played poorly at the combine. People still hold that over his head. Which is crazy. I, I just think some people just don't like how his game looks. And you know, one of the arguments that I, I had, well, actually the point that I brought up, which the agent was like, why are you draft guys always talking about a guy needs to work on his jump shot when he shoots 30% from three? And then he started naming guys says, what does LeBron shoot from three? What does Luca shoot from three? What does Tatum shoot from three? And I know that's a total, I know it's like the degree of difficulty is totally different, but he was just arguing that, you know, we... He was like, if you name the top 10 players in the NBA, how many shoot 36 or 37% from three or above? And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I can see at that point. All right, when we return, we'll talk about a few other prospects that we think could possibly outplay their consensus. But right now, let's talk about game time. And game time is a place where you can buy tickets for your favorite events and you don't have to be stressed out. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. They have killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee. So you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you will have. They have flash deals on last-minute tickets. They're easy to find for every event in your area. They'll send you images of the seats. They have a low price guarantee. They even have event cancellation protection. And check this out. If you lose your job, they will give you your money back. They have a job loss protection. So if you get fired because you are chilling and, and reading too much NBA content and you bought some tickets, then uh, they'll, they'll replace it for you. So anyway, so forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the last day of the event. They have exclusives, exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. And... Here's the most important part. Game time guarantee means you will always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and roll for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. So obviously they're pretty confident in what they have going. So download the game time app, create an account, use the code locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on NBA for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price and it is guaranteed grand slams no hitters and double plays are back and there is no better place to get in on the mlb action than fanduel which is america's number one sports book and that's because right now new customers can sign up to the plate or step up to the plate for a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars just go to fanduel.com slash locked on Sign up, place your bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. And what bets would you make? Does Aaron Judge pick up where he left off? Um, what pitcher is going to go over or under on strikeouts? So don't miss your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel is the official partner of Major League Baseball 
and locked on. Big shout out to each and every person that has made this podcast your first listen of the day. Now, if you're an everyday listener, tomorrow on the show, I will discuss the top international prospects in the 2023 NBA draft. And I'll discuss it from my personal view from scouting and evaluating them in person because I started preparing for this 2023 class back in 2021 going overseas. So it will be uh, just a different perspective point of view. All right. We left off with Leonard Miller. I want to talk a little bit more about GG Jackson. In your opinion, why are people off on GG? And do you think he can rise? I absolutely think he's he could rise. I know we talk about the guys that, like we've already talked about this, guys that are probably top 25 locks don't participate in the combine. But I do think if he came out in the combine and just played well, it doesn't have to be anything special. He doesn't need to be like this pass first guy. If he just kills it in the combine, even just one game, I think it would do a lot for his stock. I think people are just out on him because of the uh, the immaturity stuff that came up in uh, you know in the middle of the season with Instagram. How fair! I, I think that's a little bit harsh. I think they're holding that stuff a little bit over their head because I think if you talk to a lot of teams behind the scenes, I don't obviously going on Instagram is a uh, is a different animal. But I mean, guys aren't always happy. Like that's a common thing. So how you express it, you know, and how you learn from it, I think are two different things. And uh, I think stuff like that can change. Interviews will do him a lot of just like a lot of wonder. Personally, I think he's a guy who rises. The tools plus age are just so intriguing. I don't see how he's not a lottery guy. Yeah, I, I think that teams will be making a big mistake. And I think that once teams get a chance to interview him and talk to him, I think they're going to be impressed. I know it may sound crazy. It may sound biased, but he is probably one of the top two or three humans as far as like just people that I've met in this draft process just just overall people that I've just been impressed with he has this youthfulness about him and I guess the best way to describe Gigi's personality is this is a kid that has not been entitled like there's no I don't know how to put it like there's there's not a an ounce of arrogance in him at all He's the type of guy, like, if we walk into the gym tomorrow and he's doing workouts and there's a water break, he'll come clear across the court and shake your hand and be like, hey, what's up, man? Like, it's just this energetic youthfulness that that he brings. All right, who is next on your list of guys that you think could outplay their consensus draft ranking right now? Yeah, I think I, I've started diving a little bit more into Noah Clowney. He's listed at 28. I had him around 30 before I started doing a couple deep dives. And my goodness, uh, he's a, he does not play like a freshman. I think he's somebody who's going to rise. He has a pretty ideal archetype of being just a defender, a defending big that can go out and stretch the floor. Like he's a play finisher. Uh, you look at, obviously this is not a one-to-one, -one, but you look at like what Mo Bamba, um, that archetype is. Obviously it's a little bit different because the, the wingspan is so drastically different uh, because Mo Bamba has a 7'10 wingspan. But you look at that same kind of role where it's like, all right, can you be a defensive big that can hang out on the perimeter, impact shots, and defend the rim, and then just catch lobs, finish cuts, dump offs, things like that, and hit just open jumpers? That's what Mo Bamba was supposed to do. Obviously, it didn't end up playing out that way, but that same archetype is what teams chase every single year. I really think Noah Connie could be it. Like, his feel for the game is so strong. It's very advanced for someone his age, and he's young, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, he definitely like outplayed his, his his high school ranking. Him and Lively are represented by the same agency, and they're both with Clutch. And uh, I've had so many different conversations with so many different agents and, and, and decision makers over the last few weeks. And something that was brought up to me is someone said, and, and this is, I just want to get your opinion on this. It's something I never would have thought of. This person said, what if there's a conflict of interest with Clutch when it comes to who they promote? If they have Lively and Clowney and Team A has pick number 20, like, who do you promote? Because <laughs> they're similar. He said, if they play totally different positions, 
then you could you could go off a of fit, right? You could say, well, this team has such and such here, so this guy could come in and have a clear path to to more playing time. But he's like they play play pretty much the same position. He's like, I wonder is it going to be a conflict of interest when they promote Clowny over Lively or Lively over Clowny? Have you ever thought of those type of situations from an agency standpoint? Yeah, there's. I feel like there that happens once a year where. You know, there's two guards, like, obviously, I don't think this is a, the instance this year, but like, what if these are two guys who I have like identically on the board? What if you have Kobe Bufkin and Jalen Hood Shafino? And like, you, what do you do there? You know, like that kind of stuff as always like ran through my mind. Now I can't think of any specific examples, but maybe you kind of like, my guess is what the agencies would do is just kind of think, Hey, this guy needs, you know, big market more or small market more, whatever it is, one guy can handle a small market a little bit better or big market, excuse me. Like, you know, Miami is always a tough one. I think, I think you have to have a certain, uh, not only just because of the market, but also because of that team, like their culture is very set. You have to be able to promote someone who can adapt and survive in that, um, just in that culture. Yeah. And looking at this list, I think it's going to happen multiple times. You have WME has, Jairus Walker, Cam Whitmore, and Anthony Black, who are all in the same range. Then you have, you can throw Grady Dick in that range. And then CAA has Jordan Hawkins, Jet Howard, and Jalen Hood Shafino. So I think all of those guys are in that late lottery to 20 range. So this, this can be really, really interesting. All right, when we return, we'll wrap up the last group of guys that we think could outplay their draft position. All right, now I always talk about it from the agency standpoint, but I really love the basketball, just thinking about basketball from a GM standpoint. And that's why I play the Ultimate Pro Basketball GM. It is the coolest game I've played in a long time. Like I said, I've thought about how I would be a great NBA GM, and it turns out that it's not as as easy as it sounds, but if you have the same thought and have fantasized about managing your own basketball franchise, Go download the Ultimate Pro Basketball GM right now. It allows you to manage every strategic aspect of a franchise from plan through seasons, leading your franchise to glory. You can build a dynasty. In the simulation, you are responsible for dealing with the challenging personalities of the players and the coaches and hiring the right coaches and assistant. You can trade, train players, trade draft picks. You can navigate your franchise through free agency and all the ups and downs that come with being a GM. And if you are a listener, well, I guess you are a listener because you're hearing this, you get a 100% free boost to your franchise when you use the promo code locked on in the game store. So make sure you check it out to download the game. Just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code, look it up in the app stores. That is probasketballgm.com, the ultimate basketball GM. So start your fantasy today. Nissan's most electric player of the week is brought to you by the all new all electric 2023 Nissan Aria. And my Nissan electric player of the week is Paolo Bancaro. He hasn't played in a few weeks, but he just won rookie of the year. He is a guy that I was high on last year. I thought he should go number one. I didn't think he would go number one. I, I thought everybody was going to go towards Jabari Smith, but he ended up going number one. And what a draft night that was. And he had a phenomenal year. And I, I think the sky is the limit for Ben Carroll, especially if he becomes a more consistent shooter. Now, the Nissan Aria is electric. It's bril- brilliantly fierce. It's fiercely elegant, stunningly powerful, elegantly powerful. It delivers on duality, a combination of fierceness and elegance, beautiful and strong. It is the perfect crossover SUV, and it packs pin you to your seat power and in premium intelligence all-in-one electric vehicle. Shop now at NissanUSA.com. All right, last segment. All right, who is another player that you think could exceed expectations based off of the consensus? Yeah, I'm. This is, I, I think, somebody we had talked about off air before the the show. But number thirty seven on this list is Bal Balal Kulabali, and I don't know how. Uh, he's nineteen after draft night. He's six eight as a wing. Um, he's kind of this year's mystery guy, and I think he's seven two wingspan. Yeah, just ridiculous frame. 
he's really intelligent. I think the feel for the game pops when you watch him, just the way he cuts to the basket, when he cuts to the basket, like the timing of when he does the smart plays and things like that. I, I think it just really pops and his upside on both ends is just really strong. His for the year shooting wasn't even that bad and he's still a little bit away uh, in that regard. That's like seen as the one area, I think. Yeah, it's his trajectory. I first saw him January 2022. I went to watch Ishmael Kamagate play. And in France, they have this Espoirs League, which is like the under-21 league. And they play probably three or four hours before the senior team plays. The games are free. You can just go in there. It's kind of like a high school game. It's nothing but high school age kids there. Small crowd, and then they they kick you out, and then you got to come back so they can start charging you for tickets. But anyway, so I had a chance to watch him play the first time. I wasn't looking for him. I just went to the game, and France has some guys in the twenty. Well, it's they'll be in a twenty twenty four draft, but they're two thousand five generation that I was really checking out, and I was just impressed with Bilal's athleticism. But I didn't think like, yeah, this guy's gonna be your first round pick next year. But he was someone that I kept my eye on that I thought, you know, maybe 2025, he could be someone in 2024, best case scenario. So I went to France this year and I went to go watch Wimbayama play. I'm not going to sit here and say I travel all the way to France to watch Bilal. I'd be lying if I said that. But I went to watch Victor play and I went to the Espoirs game, you know, a few hours before. And I brought my camera with me and I, I have it on Twitter. And I just focused my whole camera. I just followed him the entire time. And I was just impressed with the defense, how he moves, athleticism. He's a wing shot blocker, which I think is important because he has like this knack for closing out on shooters and altering and blocking shots. But I was not expecting him to play much this year. Even when he came to to Vegas, when they had the showcase between Vic and Scoot, he played spot minutes. Um, didn't look all that great when he played. And then, this is what's crazy about how this draft process works. If Hugo Besson, who a guy that was in the 2022 draft, I think he was the last pick in the draft, if Hugo does not get hurt, I don't even know if we're talking about Bilal as a first-round pick. I mean, it was injuries that opened up playing time for him. The team is, obviously, they're trying to win. I mean, they've been in for the most part, first or second place in, in the French League. So they're trying to win. And in Europe, you just don't really see young guys getting developmental minutes on a team in the first division that is trying to compete for a championship. So he's only been able to play because of injuries. But, man, has he made the most of his opportunity? What's the highest you think he can go? Man, I it wouldn't shock me if he ends up in the lottery. It just – it all adds up to be every year, especially even in the stacked classes, it, these guys rise out of nowhere. And I, I think he could go to like one team I really like the fit for. It's such a cliche answer, but I really like Oklahoma City at 12. They have nothing to lose. I, I don't think at least. Yeah. Phew. Wow. I'm just thinking about like Ushman, a fellow Frenchman, had a little difficulties cracking their rotation. I mean, they're, they're, they're getting to the point where they're going to have so much talent that they are going to have to either condense talent and trade them for another star or have a bunch of unhappy players and agents because there's not going to be a lot of minutes behind Jalen, <laughs> Jalen Williams, Shea Gidges Alexander, Josh Giddy, then you factor in Chet. I mean, I'm even trying to figure out what Jalen Williams from Arkansas, what his role is next year when Chet comes back. And then you factor in there's going to be another lottery pick with, you know, Dort. I just do not know what <laughs> what to what to expect with Oklahoma City. Do you think they consolidate and, and make a, a trade? Or do you think they just keep all their homegrown talent and just say, hey, we're just going to let guys fight it out? Man, this is every everybody who's ever played the NBA 2K has been in this exact situation when they yes. do a my league. And <laughs> I think I think it's tough. I, I think they'll do a little bit of both. I think they'll keep a couple young guys they really like, but for the most part, they'll consolidate. Every year, random unhappy star comes up. 
who knows who it'll be this year. One that kind of fits what they need is something like Carl Anthony Towns would be interesting or Gobert if he comes available. One of those Minnesota bigs, which I don't think they'll trade Gobert, but that's a whole different story. But someone like that, I think they're going to have to consolidate. I don't think that it's realistic to both want to win and be under the salary cap and things like that near the, the tax aprons and all those and still keep all your young guys and win. Like that combination, just I don't feel like you can do all of it like down the road. Yep, that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that wraps up this episode. Actually, you know what? Let's talk about Mike Miles. One second, and I say a Wong. Where would you ah, draft my him? guy? I'm I'm taking look, I think Mike Miles' age. I mean, he's the youngest upperclassman. He's three months younger than Brandon Miller, or excuse me, older than Brandon Miller. I think he's gonna stick. I'm gonna say the same thing I said about Jalen Brunson. You take him at the end of the first round, you'll probably find a good spot for him long term. Isaiah Wong, I would take in the early second round. It won't happen. I think he's a very late second round guy, probably, but I do think both are worth being taken in the top 35, 40. All right, there you have it, Richards. Two favorite guys in the draft. Thank you for listening. Thank you for making the Locked NBA Big Boy your first listen of the day. Every day is tomorrow will be about the international prospects, and we are out. <laughs>